Many Americans believe we've heard all this talk of decline before. Japan was going to overtake the United States and it never happened. But if you step back and look at the trends we're talking about historically, you will understand that the rest of the world has been playing catch up with the West and with America for the last hundred years. Japan just began the trend, but over the last decade, dozens of countries have started playing our game and playing to win. If you take a 500 year time frame, the story of world history is quite simple. For 500 years, the West, it wasn't just the United States, it started in Western Europe. The West patented uh, six killer applications that set it apart from the rest and left the rest essentially stagnating for half a millennium. And those six killer applications were in fact open source. They were available to be downloaded by any non-Western society that wanted to. The first to do it was Japan, beginning in the late 19th century. Uh, and so what we're seeing actually is the fulfillment of a roughly century-long process whereby one Asian country after another has downloaded the killer applications of competition, of modern science, of the rule of law and private property rights, of modern medicine, of the consumer society, and the work ethic. Those six things together are the secret sauce of Western civilization. So countries around the world copied the West's secret sauce of success. That's great for global growth. But what lessons can the United States learn? How can it flourish in a world where trade and technology are accelerating every day and there are new competitors everywhere? Jeffrey Sachs points to a set of countries that have been surprisingly competitive while this new world has been emerging. Most Americans would be surprised to learn that most Northern European countries uh, on a per capita GDP basis have grown as fast or faster than the United States over the last 25 years. If you're lucky enough to have the chance to see what life is like in Stockholm or uh, Sweden or in Oslo, Norway or in Copenhagen, Denmark, and if you're lucky to see it with your own eyes, uh, you see uh, really a remarkable flourishing society with the, essentially a very broad middle class uh, that has seen a dramatic rise of uh, quality of life and on every indicator that we would want to look at uh, how long uh, people are living, uh, the life expectancy, uh, the uh, health uh, of the population, the education levels of the population, the leisure time that people have the ability to watch for the children, uh, the quality of education. These are flourishing societies. I enormously admire uh, these places and I think they found the right balance of society, of work, uh, of leisure, of, uh, of uh, being able to uh, support the family at the same time, to be able to compete internationally, uh, have a high technology economy, but at the same time not leave people behind. It's, it's a wonderful balance, and uh, I only wish that more parts of the world could find that balance, including uh, in the United States. Northern European countries in general followed a similar set of policies. Their economies are surprisingly free, totally open to trade and, and investment. Their regulations are highly competitive, yet they have higher tax rates in the U.S., and that money is used for large investments in infrastructure, education, and technology. It's also used to create a less unequal society. Now, the United States cannot and should not copy blindly from any set of countries. Americans are more comfortable with greater levels of inequality than Europeans, and attempts to create a European social democracy won't work at all. They will erode the entrepreneurial and dynamic flavor of American society. Plus, tax rates in the West are just not competitive in a world where Singapore now has a maximum rate of 20% and almost none of the major competitors, the emerging markets, have any capital gains taxes. But the example of Northern Europe shows that there are ways to stay competitive and yet have a significant safety net, which is inevitable and proper in any rich country. The key is that you have to be efficient and flexible. The problem for the U.S. is not that its government is too big or too small. In fact, among rich countries, our government takes up a smaller share of the economy. It's that it is highly inefficient. We spend lots of money on the wrong things and too little on the right things. The problem with the U.S. healthcare system, for example, is not that the government pays for healthcare. Actually, our government pays the least as a percent of the total for healthcare of any rich country. The problem is that it is totally inefficient subsidizing the overconsumption of procedures and technology that don't actually improve our health. 
Similarly, our huge subsidies for housing, agriculture, might be good politics, but they're bad economics, distorting the market, creating false booms and fake industries. Much federal spending outside of defense and interest payments on the debt goes to subsidize consumption rather than investment. And most of this consumption is for the elderly. The federal government of the United States spends about four times as much money on old people than it does on children under 18 year olds. That is surely a sign of a society that is not building for the future, but subsidizing the present. We need to invest in science, technology, infrastructure, and education. But we can't do it unless we stop the massive, wasteful subsidies. We don't need less government or more government. We need different government. We need to be efficient, and we need to be flexible. But to be flexible, we need a political system that is flexible. And in fact, we have one that is highly inflexible. Now, the aspect of America that everyone praises as being truly exceptional is our political system. American democracy is rightly seen as a path-breaking exercise in democracy, blazing a trail that the rest of the world followed. But that was in the 18th century. Right now, we are burdened by that same system with an antiquated electoral college that no one understands, a Senate that doesn't work, with bizarre laws that make it possible for one senator to block the will of the majority without ev even explaining why, a crazy quilt patchwork of tens of thousands of municipalities that create massive overlaps, multiple bureaucracies, and total waste, an electoral system that is geared towards constant fundraising and pandering to interest groups. Now remember, interest groups represent the present. They lock in the existing structure, the existing mechanisms. There are no interest groups for our children's issues. There are no lobbying groups for the industries of the future. But it is heresy to suggest that we might need to do something about a political system that is totally unable to plan for the future, invest in the future, and build for the future. But I will say it nonetheless, I don't worry about the American economy. It's amazingly dynamic, and companies will find ways to be competitive in this country. I don't worry about American society, which is the most open, innovative, and amazingly broad-minded in the world. I do worry about American politics, which is antique, sclerotic, and unsuited for the challenges of the 21st century. If we want to fix America, we will need to fix its politics. Remember, you can read more of my thoughts on this in my cover story in Time Magazine and on Time.com. Thanks for tuning in. You can catch us next Sunday in our normal time slot, 10 a.m. Eastern and Pacific.